When everything is going well in your life, everything is working out and in general you feel great, then you can't relax and you need to be prepared for the worst. Because when everything is good, it's a sign that everything is really not very good. I have new neighbors. They purchased the old Henderson property on the next road over. There were rumors they were Yankees and not much was known about them. They seemed quite affluent, as the Henderson place had a two-story farmhouse, a barn, several outbuildings, and 212 acres of land. It had been a thriving farm until Mr. Henderson got too old. His daughters had moved away, and with no one left to run it, he decided to sell and move even farther south. This infuriated his daughters. They worried he would spend their inheritance before passing away. Since he was of sound mind and body, they couldn't do a thing about it. I found it amusing. I never liked the daughters. I secretly agreed with my aunt when she remarked that they acted too superior to be proper. That's old Southern talk for being snobbish. I met the new neighbor by chance. Her Cadillac was parked on the side of the road, steam billowing from under the hood. I stopped to help. That's what neighbors do. But she seemed too influenced by redneck horror movies, refusing to open the door or roll down the window, just staring at me with a panicked look in her eyes. It was pouring rain and getting colder, so I eventually got back in my truck and drove off. Once I reached the top of Henderson Hill, I called the sheriff's department to report her. Everyone knows you need to get to the top of the hill for a signal. Otherwise, you're in a dead zone. At least that's what the locals know. Well, come on, Will, why didn't you help her? That was typical of our county deputies. Always ready to protect and serve. Unless the weather was bad, it was too cold, too hot, or there was a game on. In other cases, they were quick to respond. I tried, Wendell, but she wouldn't open the door. I can't just leave her like that. You need to come out and do something. Okay, let me grab my raincoat. Did you notice it's raining? Yeah, and it's cold. Plus, it's getting dark, and she's probably terrified, so let's get moving. If you hurry, I've got some leftover barbecue from the Democratic rally. You can take back to the station. There are buns and slaw, too. Any baked beans or potato salad? Don't push it, Wendell. If you hurry, I might consider giving you a couple pieces of fat back cake. All right, all right. Don't get defensive. I'll be there in about ten minutes. Does that cake have icing? Twenty minutes later, he joined me, and we drove back down the hill. She was still there, crying. Wendell introduced himself, and she cracked the window open a bit. Ma'am, do you need help? Yes, please. It started smoking from under the hood and just died. I couldn't reach anyone by phone. Thank goodness you found me. I didn't find you, ma'am. Will did. Why don't you pop the latch and let him take a look under the hood? He used to be a pretty good mechanic. I used to be a pretty good mechanic until everything became computerized. Now it feels like you need a PhD from MIT or you're out of luck. I couldn't afford the new tools, so I stopped. It was more of a hobby than a job for me, anyway. It took me only a moment to identify the issue. Her bottom radiator hose was split. Of course, it was the bottom one. You'll need a new radiator hose, ma'am. When Wendell takes you home, call AAA and they'll come to fix it. It's a simple repair. They should be done before lunchtime. Not tonight, she won't. Remember, Billy is out of town. His daughter is getting married on Sunday and he won't return until Tuesday. Wendell looked way too pleased to say that. The panic set in again. I can't just leave it here. My husband would be furious. I glanced at Wendell noticing the wheels turning in his small brain. Don't say it. Don't say it. And then, of course, he said it. Hey, Will, why not grab one of your heavy-duty trailers and tow it for her? 
It was late, cold, and raining, and I was running late for dinner. But you can't just leave neighbors, especially a frightened woman neighbor in a tough spot. I suppose I can do that. I'll take it back to my place and store it behind the fence for safety. That way, whoever repairs it won't need to pick it up. Does that work for you? Thank you. We'll pay whatever you ask. Could you drive me home, officer? She said, officer, like it was nearly divine, and Wendell jumped to open his door. Then the radio buzzed with a report of a wreck on Route 12, and he was the closest unit. Damn this rain. Sorry, ma'am. Will will take you home. I need to head out. Will, don't eat that barbecue. I'll swing by later. Sure. I'll put it in the fridge at the shop. You know where the keys are. Just remember to lock up after yourself. I don't want another cat giving birth in there. You'll never let me forget that, will you? Not until the smell fades. Mrs. Hatfield, are you ready? She finally shared her name, and I figured if a cop was backing me up, I couldn't really be a serial rayist or a murderous maniac targeting older, attractive Yankees. Still, she sat as far from me as possible. She owned the Henderson place with her husband. When we pulled into the driveway, all the lights were off. Why aren't the lights on? Because the power's out. Didn't you notice how dark it's been for the last mile? What am I going to do? Do you have a flashlight or any lanterns? Not that I'm aware of. Well, Mrs. Hatfield, if you're going to live out in the country, those wouldn't be bad things to invest in. Mr. Henderson used to keep a generator in the shop. Do you know if it's still there? I'm not sure. We haven't had time to explore yet. Well, get ready for some adventure. If it's still there, it should be tied into the power system. She was in luck. It was still there and barely working. A big diesel-powered rig. It made a lot of noise in the small building. There was enough fuel for about four hours. As long as it keeps running, you should be fine until the power comes back on. It usually doesn't stay out too long this time of year. If I were you... I'd get it serviced and buy a drum of diesel just in case. She nodded enthusiastically, taking notes on her tablet. I'm going to get your car now. Here's my card with my numbers. If you need anything before your husband gets home, give me a call. Your car will be at my lot. The address is on the card. Good night, Mrs. Hatfield. I can't thank you enough. Don't mention it. Good night. After making sure she was safely inside, I took off and called Sherry, knowing I was in for a lecture. Where have you been? Why haven't you called? No concern about whether I was okay, no, I missed you. I tried to appeal to her better side. Sorry, babe. I got a call from the cops. Billy's gone for the weekend and they needed me to tow a car off the road. I'll be home in about an hour and a half. I hope you're charging them plenty for making you work in this weather. I'll get what's coming. Don't worry. It was always about money with her. I never understood it. Her parents were well off and I did fine for myself. As far as I knew, she never went without anything. But the way she acted, you'd think we were broke. She hadn't been like this until about a year ago, and I always wondered what set it off. I picked up the trailer, got the car, and was home when I said I'd be. She had already gone to bed, leaving me a note saying dinner was in the microwave. A quick bite, a quick shower, and I was out cold until the alarm went off. The following day was sunny and warm, a stark contrast to the cold rain from the night before. With not much happening at the shop, I decided to head over to Advance to pick up the hose. I rolled the car off the trailer and made the repair. Around lunchtime, a man in his late forties came in, wearing a suit, tie, polished wingtips, and looking a bit frazzled. I'm Bennett Hatfield, 
I'm here to arrange for my wife's car to be towed to a garage. Can you tell me who the best mechanic in town is? He was speaking to Charlie, my assistant and general handyman. Charlie, along with Bobby and Myra, were my employees and friends. I ran an equipment rental business, things like backhoes, dozers, tractors, ditch diggers, you name it. It was a solid business, especially with the economy down. People were renting more, preferring to do jobs themselves rather than pay for expensive labor. My equipment wasn't shiny, but it was mechanically sound, and that's what mattered. I charged a bit less than the big chains and got by just fine. Charlie pointed him in my direction, and the man walked over, extending his hand. Bennett Hatfield. I couldn't help but grin. Will McCoy. Myra, who usually dealt with our more formal customers, was standing nearby. Thinking he was there to rent something from our party supply section, she burst into laughter. He frowned, confused. Sorry, Mr. Hatfield, we're not laughing at you, it's just... Hatfield and McCoy? He paused for a moment, then broke into a smile. Well, I sure hope we're not going to feud. I left my shooting iron back in Philly. Good thing, I turned mine into a plowshare. So what can I help you with? I'm looking to arrange for my wife's car to be towed to a garage. I'm new in town and don't know anyone yet. Could you recommend someone? Don't worry about it. I had some spare time this morning, so I went ahead and fixed it for you. It just needed a new hose and a bit of antifreeze. Bring your wife by any time before six and she can drive it home. He looked genuinely surprised. Well, all right. How much do I owe you? Forty bucks. The receipt for the hose and antifreeze is in the dashboard. That doesn't sound right. Yes, it is. Check the receipt. No, I mean, how much do I owe you for your trouble? Oh, I can't charge you for that. I'm not a mechanic by trade, and it wouldn't be fair. We're neighbors. I live on Howell Road, and you're on Henderson. Our houses practically back up to each other. Around here you don't charge neighbors for helping out. It's just not how things work. He looked puzzled, so I tried to clarify. Now, if you wanted to rent a backhoe, I'd charge for that. Your wife told me you're a lawyer, so if I came to you for legal advice, I'd expect to pay. But if you just needed to borrow a tool or get a ride somewhere, offering money might offend someone. Get it? He nodded slowly. I think I get it. I just need to adjust to the idea. Anyway, I really appreciate your help. About forty-five minutes later he returned with his wife. She was more attractive than I had expected and younger, but not in a trophy-wife way. Maybe around forty, though she looked more like she was in her early thirties. I suppose living a life of comfort doesn't wear you down the way hard work does. Her husband just dropped her off, probably too busy with his lawyer stuff. She thanked me over and over until I had to stop her. That's enough, Mrs. Hatfield, really. It was no big deal. Maybe not down here, but where I'm from, it's pretty exceptional. And since we're neighbors, call me Angie. She held out her hand. I'm Will, and this is Myra and Charlie. They were standing close, curious to learn more about her. She smiled, shook their hands, and instead of leaving, she had Myra show her around asking tons of questions about different equipment. She was especially impressed by the party supplies and rentals, particularly the castle. The castle is a giant circus tent, complete with turrets and flags. It can be divided into various sized rooms as needed and is popular for weddings. It used to be part of an actual circus, but when the circus shut down, I picked it up for next to nothing at an auction. With that tent and a few smaller ones, I can turn an open field into a fairy tale setting in just 24 hours. Sherry was on another one of her shopping sprees. This time she wanted a new car, a Cadillac like the one our new neighbor was driving. Her Chevrolet Impala, 
which she just had to have two years ago, suddenly wasn't good enough anymore. I reminded her that if we got that car, she couldn't trade it in for four years, which was the only reason I agreed to buy it in the first place. She scoffed at me. That thing is practically falling apart. It's got 39,000 miles on it. I need a new car. Why are you fighting me on this? Because you don't need a new car, Sherry. You just want one. We can't keep up with the neighbors. He's a lawyer, for goodness sake. Your car is just fine for now. If you think otherwise, you're welcome to buy one yourself, as long as my name isn't anywhere on the paperwork. I knew I had her there. Her credit score was terrible. She had defaulted on a car loan and some credit card debt while we were dating. I helped her get her car back but refused to help with the credit card debt. She just wouldn't pay it. One thing you need to understand before the wedding, I told her. I don't believe in credit cards. They're a trap and a waste. But you have two. That's right. And both are for business. I only use the American Express when necessary, and the other one twice a year just to keep it active. I use them if I find a good deal on equipment, and that's about it. I also had her sign a prenuptial agreement to exclude my house and business from community property. The house had belonged to my parents. When they retired and visited my sister in California, they fell in love with the place and moved there, leaving me the house. We hadn't even transferred the ownership yet because there didn't seem to be a rush. Sherry thought the transfer had already happened, and I never mentioned otherwise. The paperwork was all ready, just in case. As for my business, I kind of stumbled into it. I was subcontracting work for builders, mostly site prep, and I got tired of traveling 45 miles to rent the equipment I needed. I had some savings, borrowed a little more from my parents, and started the business. For the first three years, I reinvested almost all the profits into new equipment. By the fourth year, I was able to pay my parents back. By the time I met and married Sherry, I was proud of what I had built in such a short time and wasn't willing to risk losing it. We first met at a Christmas party hosted by one of the contractors I frequently did business with. Normally, I avoid events like these. People trying to impress themselves and each other never really interested me. But that night I was bored, so I decided to go. Naturally, all the women were dressed to the nines. There were some truly attractive ones, and being a guy, I danced, flirted, and enjoyed myself. Sherry was there with someone else, but I managed to get a dance with her. There was an undeniable spark between us. We both felt it. But since she was with someone, I didn't pursue it. As I was leaving, the hostess discreetly slipped something into my hand. Call her. She kissed my cheek, I shook hands with everyone, and left. When I got into my truck, I checked the note. It was Sherry's number. I tucked it into the dashboard, fully intending to call her. But Christmas is a busy time for my party supply business, and I ended up letting it slide. A week before Christmas, she came into the store and spoke to Myra, who pointed in my direction. Myra giggled while handing her receipt. Sherry approached me. I'm here to pick up my rental. Of course, what are you renting? She handed me the paperwork. Male companion for a Christmas party. Duration, five hours. Duties, engaging conversation, decent dancing. Kissing skills to be assessed. Failure to make a phone call may be overlooked if you're willing to be trained. Delivery at the specified address. What could I say? She was about five feet eight inches tall. She had a great figure. A pretty face. Miss... I'll personally handle your rental, and we do offer a money-back guarantee if you're not satisfied with the service. Does that sound fair? She shook my hand. Deal, but fair warning. I expect to be satisfied. Or I want a refund. She finally broke into laughter, and we went for coffee to discuss the terms and conditions further. 
Myra insisted I buy a new suit, and not trusting me, made me take her to the mall. Her husband came along too, saying that entertainment like this was too good to miss. I just want to watch her make someone else miserable for a change, he joked. Four hours, seriously? I would have gone with the first one, but of course, that wasn't enough. After trying on eight suits, she finally declared one as the one. I sighed in relief, but her husband just laughed. You don't think you're finished, do you? Nope. We weren't done. The perfect shirt, tie, even the socks had to pass inspection. It took another forty minutes just to pick out the shoes. You're not planning to choose my underwear, are you? Myra didn't even flinch. Dark blue silk boxers. You'll want to feel as good as you look. I already handled it. You're welcome. Remind me to fire you sometime soon. Only if my severance includes you modeling the suit, and I expect to see those boxers too. You're rehired. If I beg at the food court, can we go home? Maybe if you promise to get a haircut tomorrow. Her husband was still laughing as we got in the car. I thought, why not? I was dressed to the nines, so I decided to go all out and rented a Cadillac Escalade for the weekend. I was feeling pretty sharp when I arrived to pick her up, but the moment I saw her I knew I was outclassed. That dress was like a masterpiece on her, a shimmering green with a slit nearly high enough to reveal the top of her stockings, and a plunging neckline that almost reached her navel. I had no idea how she managed to keep everything in place. I later found out it was double-sided tape. Despite how daring her outfit was, she looked incredibly sophisticated. I even caught a glimpse of her garters while helping her into the car. I'm sure we had a conversation on the way there, but to this day, I can't recall a single word. We danced and socialized, meeting people whose names I forgot immediately. She was the star of the party, constantly asked to dance. Though she gave side glances, it was her choice. She did accept one slow dance with a guy who got a bit too handsy. I was halfway across the dance floor when the song ended, and she quickly grabbed my hand, leaving Mr. Octopus standing there. No more slow dances with anyone but you, she whispered in my ear as we returned to our table. That was fine by me. On the way home, she cozied up as close as possible, playfully nibbling my ear. At every red light I kissed her until the cars behind us started honking. But I really like you. So why don't we wait and test my mattress? If you sleep with me and then leave, I'll just take it as a lesson learned. I actually left about twelve hours later to make us breakfast. In addition, the Escalade stood motionless for two days. We both demanded each other, and I didn't look back. We moved in together after two months and got married seven months later. We planned to enjoy a few years as a couple before starting a family. She was twenty-five and I was twenty-nine at the time. Now three years had passed, and I had been dropping hints about wanting to begin our family. For some reason, about a year ago, she began to change, becoming more demanding and materialistic. She insisted that we needed a new house to start our family despite our current home having four bedrooms, which I thought was sufficient. Then she maxed out the credit card she managed to get despite her credit history, and when I cut it in half after paying off the balance, she didn't speak to me for two days. She had a job and earned decent money, yet she was always broke. I covered all the bills, utilities, our phone plan, cable, and regular household expenses, except for groceries, which she had initially agreed to handle. If you opened her closet, you would find clothes with tags still attached, likely never to be worn, and four or five pairs of shoes that had never touched the ground. The silent treatment after the car incident lasted around five days. On the sixth day, she came home to find me taking her clothes out of the closet. 
She glanced my way, but didn't say a word. I can't keep living like this. If I'm going to be alone, I might as well be alone. I called your mother. She wasn't thrilled, but agreed to let you stay with her for two weeks. We should be able to find you a place by then. I'll cover the deposit, the first two months' rent, and get the utilities set up and paid for the same period. This should give you time to adjust to living on your own again. You need to learn to budget. You'll have to take care of yourself now. To my surprise, she fainted. I moved her clothes aside and laid her down, grabbing a cold cloth to wipe her forehead. She came to with a start. Will, I just had the strangest dream. You were kicking me out, but I can't remember why. She looked at her side of the closet through the open door, saw the clothes on the bed and the suitcases on the floor, and began to cry. She sobbed, pleading with me not to make her leave, promising she would do better, begging me, please, please. I let her cry for a bit before telling her to wash her face and meet me in the kitchen. She sat down in the kitchen chair, avoiding my gaze. I'm serious, Sherry. I can't live like this anymore. The tantrums, the reckless spending, the refusal to discuss starting a family. It feels like I don't know you at all. If you want to leave, just say it. If not, things need to change. She finally admitted that the thought of becoming a mother terrified her, bringing back memories from her childhood. As the second of three children, all born within a year of each other, she often felt overlooked. When her parents divorced when she was twelve, it had a profound impact on her. I can still picture my mom crying. She had three teenagers to care for and was on her own, which took a toll on her. She started drinking and pretty much ignored us. Dad vanished after the first year, moving halfway across the country. I can't subject a child to that. I took her hand. Sweetheart, I'm really sorry about your past. But I'm not talking about a big family. Just one child. If we decide to have another, we'll wait at least two years. And this is important. I will never leave you. I promise. We circled around each other softly for about three weeks, but gradually we became the typical young couple we were meant to be. She cut back on her spending and even opened a savings account. Three months later she showed me the balance, and I was genuinely impressed. I told her how proud I was of her, and she laughed. Don't be too proud. It'll be empty soon enough. I thought she was going to say she was buying a new car, but instead she mentioned she had different plans for the money. She wanted to buy furniture for the nursery, and I would need to paint it. Did I like light blue? It took a moment for her words to register. What? What did you just say? She wore that knowing smile women have when they've successfully flipped your world upside down. I said that in about seven months we'll have a son, the nursery needs to be ready, so you'll need to cut back at the store a bit more, especially towards the end. I had never cried in front of her before. She told me in my office after just coming from the doctor. She had stopped taking her pills, wanting to surprise me. Well, that plan certainly worked. When the tears began to flow, it frightened her. Did I make a mistake? I thought this was what you wanted if you... That was all she could manage before I overwhelmed her with kisses. Soon her tears were mingling with mine. Myra sensed something was off when we came out later. Known for being sensitive and discreet, she blurted out, What the hell is going on with you two? You look like someone slapped you both and you loved it. Myra, can you keep a secret? She nodded in agreement. That woman was quicker than the Internet when it came to spreading news. Myra, we're having a baby. In seven months, it's going to be a boy. Promise me you won't tell anyone. We want to surprise my mom. Can you promise? She muttered, uh-huh, while trying to pull her phone out of her pocket as she walked away. 
I watched her with a grin before turning back to Sherry. I hope you've already told your mom. She smiled back. I stopped by before coming here. By the end of the day, everyone in town will know. I thought if we told her first, it would take some pressure off me. True to form, by the time we went to lunch, people were stopping us on the street to hug Sherry and shake my hand. We nearly ran out of time to eat because of all the congratulations. When we returned, there was a huge banner above the counter, white with blue bows. Congratulations, Will and Sherry, it's a boy. I looked at Myra, and she smirked. As if I could keep a secret that big. You guys knew I'd burst if I couldn't say anything. I laughed and went back into the office. The pregnancy was difficult. After seven months, Sherry was placed on bed rest. I looked at her pale, drawn face and realized we would never have another child. It would be too risky for her. Sherry wasn't the easiest patient. Her mom moved in, as she was the only one who could tolerate being around her, especially during tough times, when she'd tell Sherry to be quiet and leave her alone for a few hours. The delivery lasted 17 hours before they finally opted for a C-section. Sherry was utterly exhausted. When she was finally able to speak, she told me, Never again. I agreed. Since she was already in the hospital, she decided to have her tubes tied before she left. William Bryan Sanford weighed nearly nine pounds, which explained much of her discomfort. He had a full head of thick black hair like mine. I felt let down when the nurse mentioned that his real hair color might not show up for a while. She was wrong. He never lost that hair, and it remained jet black. If you haven't experienced it, no words can truly capture the feeling of being a parent. It's breathtakingly beautiful and utterly terrifying at the same time. It's no longer about you, and it never will be again, even after they grow up. They become your entire world and all your actions revolve around their well-being. Spontaneous outings and romantic weekends fade into the background. Now every detail needs to be planned, even simple trips like going to the grocery store, complete with all the necessary supplies. Unfortunately, Sherry didn't adapt to motherhood as well as I had hoped. It was clear she loved him, but as soon as I got home, she would pass him to me and collapse onto the recliner for an hour, which she called her baby recuperation time. I didn't mind. I'd walk around holding him, sharing stories about my day and our future together. I talked about Little League, Boy Scouts, camping trips, girls, anything I thought might interest a boy. He would gaze at my face, gurgling and smiling, completely unaware of the words. It frustrated Sherry to no end that he rarely cried when I was around. I'd come home to find him crying, especially if he was unwell. When I picked him up and started walking with him, he would usually calm down almost immediately. I took two weeks off to spend time with Sherry and Billy after the baby was born. When I returned, there was a large sign outside the building that read, Sanford and Son Equipment Rentals. No junk. Myra and Charlie were there smiling, and it brought tears to my eyes. My screensaver featured a slideshow of Billy, Sherry, and us together. My friendship with the Hatfields started gradually. One day, Angie came in asking to rent a tractor. I inquired about her plans for it. I want to plant a garden. I've already ordered seeds from Baker's Creek and need a tractor and equipment to prepare the beds. I admired her resolve, but I refused to rent her a tractor, which surprised her. Why not? Because you don't know how to operate one. Tractors can be very dangerous if you're inexperienced. If something happened while using it, I'd feel terrible, and I wouldn't want to lose you as a customer or a friend. I can't have that on my conscience. Besides, you don't need to rent one. I saw that little Yanmar and the equipment in your shed. You already have what you need. 
Mr. Henderson had a big auction when he retired and sold off all his farming gear. He later bought the Yanmar, because he enjoyed having a tractor and liked gardening. I figured it had hardly any hours on it. It won't start. I noticed the determination in her eyes, and I realized if I didn't help her, she'd find someone else. The battery is probably dead. How about I come by tomorrow? It's Saturday and I can take a look. Oh, I couldn't take you away from your family. You won't. I'll bring them along. So that Saturday I took Sherry and Billy with me. Angie spent an hour doting on the baby, holding him the entire time. Sherry was annoyed by Billy's crying, but he stopped once Angie held him. I brought my battery charger and hooked it up to the tractor. While it charged, Bennett and I scouted possible garden spots. Are you sure you want her on a tractor? His response was honest. No, but you have no idea how determined she can be. I'm asking you to keep an eye on her and provide some guidance. We discussed it while Angie and Sherry headed to the kitchen, returning with a platter of sandwiches and a large bowl of potato salad. As we ate, we talked about her garden projects. They cleared the table, refreshed our drinks, and listened to me. Ben and I have discussed this. He'll have a roll bar and a seat belt installed on the tractor before you do anything serious with it. Come out to the barn for your first lesson. I took the tractor out of the barn and had her sit on it. I demonstrated the brakes, throttle, hydraulics, and gears. I need you to remember this and be cautious. The gears in a tractor operate differently than in a car. When you release the clutch, the tractor will move regardless of the gear. It won't stall like a car. So if you accidentally start in a high gear, you could lift the front end off the ground. If you're on a slope, it could tip over. That's why the roll bar is important. If you're buckled in and stay within the bar, you might have a scare, but you should be safe. I had her set it in the lowest gear and low range, letting her drive slowly around the field. I walked alongside giving her instructions. I had her stop and practice operating the hydraulic three-point hitch with a turn plow attached. Try to always use equipment when running the tractor. If you pop the clutch or hit a steep incline, the equipment will help prevent flipping over. It might jolt you, but it's better than the alternative. I instructed her to lower the plow and make a few passes in her chosen spot. She was beaming while Ben snapped photos. She looked disappointed when I returned the tractor to the shed and took out the key. It wouldn't start anyway, the battery is dead. A friend will come by Tuesday to install the roll bar and seat belt. I'll get a battery for you, and he'll give you a key and a spare once it's done. Just remember, don't drive it alone at first. Wait for Ben to be home. We'll come by next Saturday to show you how to use and change the equipment. After hugs and handshakes, we left. Sherry was excited on the way home. She has a stunning house. It looks nothing like when Mr. Henderson owned it. She has prints on her walls that must be worth a fortune. She casually mentioned a trust fund when we discussed art. Did you know they still have their house up north? It was her grandmother's and now it's hers. Good for them. They're a lovely couple. They deserve it. She was quiet for the rest of the ride. Later I saw her looking up the prints she had noticed, checking their prices. She was right. Some were indeed in the thousands. Sherry returned to her job because she enjoyed working, and we still needed her income. Plus, I knew she would go stir-crazy being home all day with no one to talk to. We had a great time teaching Angie how to operate the tractor. Ben learned too, but he wasn't as enthusiastic as she was. Angie planted her garden and bought a small tiller for when the tractor wasn't necessary. She cried with joy when she picked her first green beans. She kept expanding the garden, and I warned her it might become overwhelming, but she just laughed. Ben leaves early and comes home late. There's only so much cleaning I can do, and I'm not one for sitting around watching TV. 
Plus, it gives me something to write about for my blog. She had started a blog called Gone Country to share her experiences of adjusting to rural life. It became quite popular, humorous, entertaining, and sometimes serious, with plenty of pictures and videos. I made appearances in a few, as she referred to me as her spiritual advisor on all things country. It was a bit embarrassing, especially when Myra began reading it. Angie decided she wanted to be as organic as possible. I introduced her to a friend who owned stables, and he agreed to let her have some manure for her garden. The catch? She had to clean the stalls first. I thought that would end her enthusiasm, but soon she was equipped with gloves boots and heavy clothes. She jokingly called it her shit uniform on her blog, even posting a picture of herself dressed for the task, with a bandana covering her hair. She cleaned three stalls twice a week, and her compost pile was growing into a mountain. Sherry accompanied me to the stables for a while, but eventually her visits became rare. I think I've heard all I can about manure, crop rotation, and organic pesticides, she said. I took Billy with me about every other time, placing his carrier in the shade so I could keep an eye on him. During those days, Angie spent as much time holding him as she did gardening. After we became closer friends, I asked her if she ever wanted kids. Yes, I did. When it didn't happen, we got tested. Ben is sterile. Some accident from when he was younger. We talked about adoption, but it made him uneasy. I dropped the subject because he's my husband and soulmate, and the thought of not being with him was unbearable. Sometimes, when I'm holding Billy, I think about what I'm missing. But then he makes a mess in his diaper, and I'm grateful I can hand him back to his parents. Who? Here. Take him. She held him out to me as if he were a bucket of toxic waste. Ben joined us later and sat in the shade. Will, I have a favor to ask. My new partners and I are planning a get-together, and I want to host it here, a traditional southern barbecue. I'd like you and Sherry to cater it for me. And, Will, you'll get paid for this. We won't discuss it further without that. This isn't just a casual gathering. It's a business function. I'd have to hire someone anyway, and I know how excellent your food is. I want them to remember it for a long time. I hadn't cooked professionally in a few years, and I missed it. I agreed. He and Angie looked relieved. Thanks, Will. I'll need party supplies, tents, chairs, tables, etc. Angie will handle the coordination. Most of my clients will be here, and I really want to make a good impression. Three weeks isn't much time to organize something like this. Angie started meeting us at our house every other day to coordinate. My first question was about how many people to cook for. We have 80 confirmed, but let's plan for 100. We don't want to run out of food. And how many kids? None, just adults. She noticed my frown. What's wrong? Nothing. She let out a snort. Come on, Will, if you have something to say, say it. Okay, I think you're sending the wrong message. This is the South, and we value family here. You should invite the wives and kids to create a more personal connection. Some might not like it, but most will appreciate it. You should send invitations, but also follow up with a phone call to find out how many kids will be there and their ages, so you can plan age-appropriate games and entertainment. A y'all be sure to come will resonate much better than a note saying your presence is requested. She sat there with her mouth agape and called Ben. Have you sent the invitations yet? No? Good. We need to change them. And I need the names and phone numbers of every wife. I'll explain later. Bye, hun. She gave me a suspicious look. Ever thought about running for office? You'd win the barbecue vote. No, I laughed. I've just hosted a lot of parties. You learn along the way. Angie managed the phone calls, and the number skyrocketed from a hundred to nearly three hundred. 
We brought in three local girls to assist with serving. On my side, I had Sherry, Myra, and Charlie helping out. It was a picture-perfect day, hot but not oppressive, with a gentle breeze. I had set up the castle tent as the dining area, complete with fans installed in the overhead supports to keep it cooler. 400 pounds of perfectly cooked shredded pork, 20 chickens and two beef briskets prepared separately for our Jewish partners, clearly labeled for the side dishes to indicate what was not kosher. We had potato salad, coleslaw, baked beans, squash casserole and grilled vegetables, mostly sourced from Angie's garden. For dessert, there were various homemade cakes and pies, along with chilled watermelon for the kids as a special treat. I was exhausted, but it was all worth it. Three hundred people were invited, but four hundred showed up, with the extra guests mostly being kids. I had Charlie supervise the three teenage boys who were parking cars. Guests mingled and socialized for an hour before dinner, with a mostly self-serve arrangement to maintain a relaxed atmosphere. Due to the family-oriented theme, no alcohol was allowed in the dining tent. I had set up a smaller tent nearby with two kegs and a self-serve bar, which would open an hour after the meal. The senior partners made it clear that excessive drinking would not be tolerated. Children ran around in packs laughing and screaming as they played on the equipment I had provided and engaged in various games. Angie and Ben were exemplary hosts, moving from group to group to ensure everyone was enjoying themselves. Staying true to tradition, the men tended to gather to discuss business while the women chatted about their partners. We had placed comfortable cushioned furniture under every shade tree. I paused to admire Sherry, looking elegant in her modest sundress with her hair in a bun. She was surrounded by guests complimenting us on the meal, and we exchanged numerous business cards. Just before the event concluded, we gathered everyone in the cleaned dining tent for a few brief speeches. I had set up a small public address system with microphones. The senior partner expressed his gratitude to everyone for attending, wishing them success in their future ventures. He commended Angie and Ben for hosting the event and thanked Sherry and me for organizing it. What he said next took everyone by surprise, especially since he was known for giving lengthy speeches. That's it. That's all I have to say. It's been such a great time. I'm not going to ruin it by dragging this out. There's some leftover food and containers for anyone who wants to take some home. Don't waste it. Also, the ice cream is ready. Let's all grab a bowl. He stepped down, later telling me it was the most applause he'd ever received for a speech. We had ice cream machines set up with a variety of flavors, including chocolate, banana, pineapple, fresh blueberry, and, of course, vanilla. Both kids and some adults got ice cream headaches from eating too fast. Angie's garden was a major hit. I saw her several times giving tours to groups of ladies and a few men, showing them around and answering questions. She would often pick a ripe tomato or a handful of beans to give away. Some of the watermelons we had chilled for dessert came from her garden, and they quickly became the most sought after. The seeds were slightly larger than usual, making them ideal for the seed-spitting contest the kids were having. Sherry almost had a heart attack when Angie handed her the check. The bill had grown so large that they wouldn't let Ben cover it, turning it into a true corporate event. There was also another check, a 25% bonus, along with a note from the senior partner thanking us again. I took the bonus and gave a portion to Charlie, Myra, and the kids who had helped. The rest I gave to Sherry. She earned it. It appeared that Ben worked for a firm specializing in business law, and soon after, I started getting requests to organize parties. The demand skyrocketed, and the profits were so substantial that we decided to establish it as a separate business. Sherry left her job to become the manager, and she was not only good at it but kept improving. 
Naturally, we sourced all the rentals from our own company. I had to promote Myra to manage the rental business, and she brought her husband on board. He had recently been laid off and we needed extra hands, so it worked out well. Except for one issue. She's the boss at home, and now she's the boss at work, too. I'll never make another decision in my life. This is your fault, Will. Just deal with it, Donnie. Think about it. How many men actually get to sleep with their boss at the end of the day? That cheered him up. Sherry started dressing better and sometimes had evening meetings with clients. We finally earned enough to buy her that Cadillac. I thought life was perfect. Winter came and went. In the party business, Saturdays were working days. You were either working an event, planning one, or meeting with clients. By our arrangement, Sherry handled the meetings and most of the planning, while I coordinated the equipment, staff, and food prep. The party business was actually bringing in more money than the rental side. It felt like we never had time for each other anymore. It reached a tipping point when she started scheduling meetings on Saturday evenings, often coming home after 11 p.m. I asked her to stop, but she insisted she had to work around the client's schedules, and evenings were the most convenient for them. After three straight weeks of this, I snapped. I told her that if she had another late meeting, I was done. I wouldn't cook, coordinate, or be involved. I was out. I thought we were partners, she yelled. I'm more interested in our marriage right now. You need to decide. What's more important to you, the business or us? She kept yelling, but I ignored her and went to get Billy, who had been woken up by her shouting. I followed through on my warning. The next month she had a meeting that kept her out until 11.30. On Sunday afternoon, she wanted to plan it with me. No. No what, honey? I'm not helping plan, coordinate, and I'm definitely not cooking for it. I told you, the next contract that made me lose a Saturday night with my wife would be the one you handled on your own. I think I'll take Billy for a ride. I left her standing there, speechless. It was a disaster. The clients didn't like the food, the service, or the atmosphere. There was no bonus, and the client expressed disappointment that she hadn't lived up to her reputation. Up until that point, she had been treating me poorly. On Sunday, she came out of the bedroom holding a small white handkerchief, waving it around. Truce? I was feeding Billy breakfast. No. Her eyes widened. I'm not accepting a truce. I want to surrender. Meet my terms and conditions, and we'll move forward. Refuse or ignore them, and it's over. No negotiations. Take it or leave it. I picked Billy up. I'm heading over to see Ben and Angie. He wants my advice on something. We'll be back in an hour or so. Billy adored Angie, and she absolutely doted on him. She babysat for us often when we worked events. He was just learning to talk, and one of his first words was Angie. She teared up when he said it. He was also learning to walk, and as soon as I put him down, he would rush to her as quickly as his wobbly little legs could carry him. He also learned to say Ben and would try to follow him around whenever he could. What Ben wanted to talk to me about was the small dirt track car they had sitting in one of their sheds. Mr. Henderson didn't drive, but he was passionate about racing and sponsored a car. I knew the engine was shot, but the roll cage and transmission were still in working order. Do you think it can be repaired? No, it needs a new engine and a few other parts. It can't really be fixed, but it can be rebuilt. Why are you interested? He looked a little embarrassed. I'm a big NASCAR fan. I've always wanted to drive a race car, and this would be the perfect chance. You just never know with people. How does Angie feel about this? She's not too thrilled, but she's willing to watch me race once. I need you to reassure her that it's safe. It is safe, right? More or less. 
I've never seen anyone die in a car like this, but you can definitely get banged up. Start with beginner races and learn as you go. We got the car fixed up. Ben received some tips from experienced drivers, and before long he became a regular every Friday night at the local dirt track. Sherry and I had patched things up, and one evening we went to watch him. It was loud, it was messy, and I could tell Ben was loving it. Charlie, along with a few neighborhood kids, acted as his pit crew. The rules were pretty loose, so we were able to be in the pits with them. Ben had been in the lead, but then he started slowing down and losing position before pulling into the pit. The car was fine, but Ben had been fighting the flu all week, and the heat had drained his energy. We pulled him out of the car and began hydrating him. Both Ben and Charlie were frustrated. Ben was leading in points for his class and had a real shot at becoming the points champion. But if he didn't finish the race, it would seriously hurt his chances. Charlie spoke up. You know, if someone's sick, they're allowed a substitute. He was looking straight at me. It won't work, Charlie. The roll cage is built for his size. I wouldn't fit in it. We need someone his size or smaller. We both turned to look at Angie. Oh, no. I don't know anything about racing. You don't have to race. All you need to do is shift gears. Just stay at the back of the pack and keep out of the way. He'll get credit for finishing the race and it'll save a lot of points. Ben overheard the conversation. Do it, honey. I really want that trophy. The cage will protect you. Just be careful. She looked at him for a few seconds. Hand me the helmet, and if I crash, not a word from anyone. We strapped her in. Stay low, keep a steady pace, and they'll eventually leave you alone. Are you sure about this? She looked straight into my eyes. No. Then she floored the gas, sending gravel flying everywhere. The first fifteen laps were pretty smooth. The other drivers understood the situation and kept their distance. All except one. He was just behind Ben in the point standings, and if he managed to knock her out before the finish, it would boost his ranking significantly. On the next lap, he gave her a bump, terrifying Angie. We heard her shout over the headset, What the hell is he doing? I had the other headset. He's trying to take you out of the race. When he comes up on you again, tap the brakes, then floor it. He'll hit you, but it won't be enough to cause serious damage. Plus, by speeding up, he might get stuck in traffic and lose a few spots. She executed the move flawlessly. He was closing in fast, but she tapped the brakes just before he reached full speed. The moment his bumper touched hers, she floored it. He got caught up in the pack, and she actually gained a lap. He caught up to her again, but this time luck was on his side, and he managed to push her into the wall. The caution flag came out, and she pulled into the pit. She jumped out of the car, staring at the crumpled fender. She threw her helmet against the car in frustration. Can you fix it? We can pull it out, but there's no time to hammer it into shape. She was pumped up, clearly loving the adrenaline. Just pull it off and get me back in the race. I'm putting that jerk into the wall. Let's go. Charlie worked on the fender while I got her back into the car and strapped in. Don't get reckless. That's how you get hurt. Watch him. He'll try the same thing again if he gets a chance. Charlie shouted clear, and she was back on the track. She was driving like she'd stolen a Maserati, overtaking cars left and right. When she saw him edging closer, I was yelling into her headset, Cut left, now! She swerved to the top of the track, catching him off guard. He slammed into the next car, sending it spinning and triggering a pileup. Angie slipped past, and when the caution was lifted, she was in third place. By the time the checkered flag came down, she had worked her way to the front of the pack, but because of the lost laps, she finished seventh out of fifteen. The guy who had tried to ram her couldn't finish the race and ended up in fifteenth, putting him even farther behind Ben in the standings. 
He stormed toward our pit with his crew, but Angie was already out of the car, ripping off her helmet. How's it feel to get beat by a girl, jerk? Who? 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 She turned around, bent over, and slapped her behind. Kiss it, loser! Then she burst out laughing and hugged Ben. The guy didn't know what to do. He took a deep breath, but I stepped in. The next words out of your mouth better be respectful. She beat you fair and square. Take it as a lesson. His crew, who had been ready for a fight moments before, were now grinning. He spun around and walked off. Meanwhile, Sherry had been snapping pictures like crazy. After that, Angie was hooked. She used some of her trust fund money to buy a car. The local track had a women's division, and she competed in it for the rest of the year. Although she started too late to accumulate points, she managed to win two races. Ben won his trophy as well. They had already begun planning for the next year. His firm, along with some of their clients, agreed to paint both cars in matching colors with their logos prominently displayed. Our business logos were on them, too. It was a small, outlawed dirt track circuit, barely legal and recognized, so they knew it was mostly just for fun. However, many successful racers had started their careers on tracks like these. For Angie and Ben, it was a shared hobby that brought them closer together. What were Sherry and I sharing? Nothing, really, aside from Billy. Our business had grown, and we now had two crews working. She was dressing better, acting more arrogant, and barely had time for Billy or me. She had joined a professional women's organization and became quite involved, attending meetings and drinks every two weeks. I didn't mind, and when she won an award, I was genuinely proud. I went to the banquet, and when I was introduced as her husband, I noticed some of her friends looked uncomfortable. I wasn't as oblivious as people thought, so I asked her about it. Some of those women seemed awfully surprised when I was introduced as your husband. Do you have a city husband I don't know about? I was joking, but her face turned bright red. She quickly recovered, though. No, honey, they were just surprised to see you weren't imaginary. You really should come to more mixers with me so I can show you off. It was a reasonable explanation, but something didn't sit right with me. We got swamped with work after that, so I pushed it to the back of my mind. She seemed to have gotten a wake-up call and stayed a little closer to home. As fall arrived, business slowed down. We went back to just one crew. They were well-trained, so sometimes we let them handle things, while one of us made a courtesy visit to check in with the customer. We had a solid group of clients, and some of them actually turned into good friends. His boss called me and wanted to throw a combined birthday and victory party for Ben. Ben was a likable guy, and excellent at what he did, and they wanted to show their appreciation while giving him a chance to talk about his racing career. They asked me to handle the cooking. How many people? Around forty, all adults, just his close friends. We don't want you there as a professional caterer, per se, since you're probably Ben's closest friend outside of work. He even said that if it weren't for you, he and Angie might not have stayed together. We didn't want to offend you by hiring someone else. I'd be happy to cook, but let's not go overboard. How about this? I'll handle the meats, pork, and chicken and make the coleslaw. Ask the wives to bring desserts and side dishes. Ben will probably appreciate that more. I mentioned the date to Sherry. I've already got an event that day. We've signed the contract. I can't make it. I was a bit frustrated. These are our friends. If it weren't for them asking us to do their first party, we wouldn't even have this business. It would be disrespectful not to show up. Just make an appearance at the event, ensure everything's running smoothly, hand it off to the crew, and come back. Think of Ben and Angie. I'd already set up the cookers and pulled my truck back to clear more parking space. Since our properties bordered each other, 
Ben and I had cut a small path through the woods from my deck to his porch. We'd ride our four-wheelers back and forth. It was much quicker. If I pulled into my driveway and saw a pink helmet hanging on the deck railing, I knew Angie was visiting. The party was lively, with everyone socializing and enjoying themselves. Sherry had just called to say she was stuck at work, but would arrive within the hour. We were running low on ice, which one of the partners was supposed to bring. I had some leftover in our freezer from a party the previous week, so I offered to take my four-wheeler to grab more. I had to use Ben's because mine was blocked in. He had forgotten to fill it up with gas and I ran out about halfway home, forcing me to walk. Just as I was about to emerge from the woods, I spotted them. The blinds on the patio door were open, and you could look right into the living room. There, on the couch, a couple was really having fun. I thought one of the neighborhood kids had broken into the house. There have been a lot of thefts lately. They didn't take much, but they threw a little party and vandalized, drinking whatever booze they could find and soiling the beds. I was already reaching out to call 911 when the lovers switched places. It was Sherry. I recognized the man, one of the junior staff from Ben's office. They wondered why he missed the party. My first impulse was to rush in and take them both down, but having a best friend who's a lawyer taught me a few things. Ben had actually worked as a divorce lawyer for a while before moving here. I hated it he told me one day. You become cynical watching people destroy their lives. If they could just approach it logically, it would save a lot of heartache. Unfortunately, acting logically is tough, especially when infidelity is involved. And if someone gets physically hurt, it complicates things further. It's usually the guy who ends up on the losing side, and it seriously undermines his negotiating power. Sometimes they even risk losing their kids, as her lawyer will paint a damaging picture of his supposed violent tendencies. In a divorce, especially when kids are involved, no one really wins. The lawyers profit. But that's about it. Standing in the woods, witnessing my wife's betrayal, it was nearly impossible to stay calm. Shaking with anger, I was heading toward the door when Ben's words came to mind. I recalled what he had said about bargaining positions, so I stepped back into the trees. I retraced my steps down the path a bit and called Ben. He answered in a cheerful, slightly tipsy tone. Hey, buddy, what's taking you so long? Should I send Angie to find you? No, put Angie on. I need to ask her something. When Angie came on the line, she asked if she should come pick me up. Since she rarely drank, she was clear-headed. Angie, I really need your help. I just saw Sherry at the house, and she was with someone and hardly dressed. I want to confront her, but I don't think that's a good idea right now. I need someone sober to bear witness, and I also need a reference for a divorce lawyer. Please help me. I could hear the concern in her voice. You poor man, are you sure? Wait. If you weren't sure, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Stay put until I arrive. Twenty minutes later, Angie, Ben, and two of his partner's wives walked down the trail. Are you certain, Will? I showed them the photos I had on my phone. One of the women spoke up. I'm a divorce lawyer, Will. An excellent one, actually. I have my own practice, which my husband thought would be a good idea. I'm here to offer advice on how to proceed and my services if you need them. I had no idea she was a lawyer. I only knew her socially as the wife of one of Ben's partners. Angie was hugging me and rubbing my shoulders to calm me down, reminding me to think of Billy. Thanks, Julie. I'll take both if you don't mind. What should I do next? The most challenging thing in this situation is to stay calm. Don't engage them in conversation when we confront them. Let me handle it. Keep your composure, Will. It'll give you the upper hand. 
She smiled in the darkness, a predatory grin. That said, if he's foolish enough to try to attack you in front of a group of lawyers, you have every right to defend yourself. Ben ended the call. They're almost here. Let's go. They had arranged it. The senior partners were pulling into my driveway, supposedly for the ice I had promised. The rest of us waited just outside on the deck, using the side steps to avoid the light from the patio door. We heard a knock. Sherry? Are you there? Will sent us to get more ice. We ran out. He continued speaking loudly when she didn't answer. Well, he did give us the key. Come on, guys. I don't like being in someone's house when they're not around. Sherry and her lover were gathering their clothes when they heard the door open. She flung the door open, and he darted out onto the deck to hide in the shadows. The look on his face was priceless when I switched on the light. We had installed an outdoor switch for moments when we wanted to enjoy the darkness without going back inside, usually when we were about to get undressed. Four cell phones were snapping pictures as he stood there holding his pants, shorts, and shoes. Sherry had managed to get dressed and was leading the others to the kitchen when she spotted us on the porch. She screamed, dashed out of the house, and ran away. He was at a loss for words, but the senior partner raised his hand. Not a word. Be in my office at nine on Monday. Now go. His authoritative tone left no room for discussion, and he walked away. Angie and Ben flanked me, each grabbing a hand to prevent me from making a scene. Julie handed me her card and told me to come to her office at two on Monday afternoon, then hugged me. We returned to the party. I went just to avoid being in the house. Unsurprisingly, it ended early, and I spent the night in their guest room. I hardly slept, and Angie woke me up by letting Billy loose on me. You can't sleep through the antics of a two-year-old. I suddenly realized I hadn't thought much about how to protect him, and Angie had woken up early to take care of him telling my mother-in-law that I had too much fun, so she volunteered to pick him up for me. She had helped out before when we were just starting our party business. He sat on Angie's lap, feeding her breakfast and smearing syrup all over her face, giggling uncontrollably. It brought smiles to all of us. When she took him to the bathroom to clean them both up, Ben mentioned we would discuss things when it was time for his nap. That afternoon, we held our first strategy meeting. Angie got straight to the point. Divorce? Yeah, in hindsight, I can see it coming. We stopped sharing our dreams. She always wanted to live in a big city while I've always been a country guy with deep roots here. What about Billy? I definitely want custody. I think a child would complicate the lifestyle she desires. Ben had some insights. I agree that Billy wouldn't fit into her lifestyle, but he gives her leverage over you. She could use a custody battle as a way to negotiate a bigger financial settlement. Everything else seems straightforward. Be cautious with Julie. She's ruthless and will do whatever it takes to get her way. We need to ensure this doesn't escalate from negotiation to all-out war. I hadn't seen her for six days. When I got home, she was there. It took all my strength not to kick her out. She noticed my expression and stepped back. Please, don't say anything right now. I probably deserve it, but I'm just here to pick up some things and see Billy. Please, Will. Just for a little while. Then I'll leave quietly. You can even have my car keys. I fell for it, keeping my distance while she played with Billy. She had been so inattentive to him lately that he seemed bored. She asked for her keys back to open the trunk, then asked if I could help her carry out her clothes. I went back inside for another load when I heard her car start. I rushed through the screen door and got to her before she could shift into gear. 
I grabbed the keys and tossed them into the driveway. She was screaming as I pulled Billy out of the car seat. Damn you, damn you, damn you, he's mine and you can't take him away. Billy was crying, confused about what was happening. She was cursing up a storm when she noticed Angie filming everything on her iPhone. She rode her four-wheeler, a habit she'd developed, to check on Billy and make sure I was okay. She would stay for 30 or 40 minutes before heading home, just before Ben arrived. You bit. I should have known you'd be here. Giving him a little something before hubby gets home? How many times has poor Ben had to settle for leftovers? Does he hide in the closet? And watch? Angie turned pale with rage. I can't imagine what would have happened if I hadn't shouted. Sherry, leave. And I mean right now. From now on, if you want to visit Billy, get a court order. Get out of my life before I call the cops. I had so much more I wanted to say, but my priority was Billy. Sherry stormed out, still yelling. Angie recorded every word. The next day, Julie had the tape and filed a restraining order until Sherry underwent a mental evaluation. She documented Sherry's outburst. I wondered where Sherry was staying. Apparently, the guy she was with was her new partner, another mark against her. He was fired due to the affair. They used flowery language, but the message was clear. He was out. No references provided. He found another job, but at a reduced salary. I sent a letter to all our event customers, informing them I was no longer affiliated with the business, but would honor all remaining contracts. From that point on, Sherry was responsible. I considered just walking away, but Julie convinced me otherwise. You have a good reputation, and you might want to return to it later. Plus, it gives Sherry a source of income, which might matter down the line. She hired her own attorney, and the legal battle began. She wanted the house, but too bad, it was still in my parents' name. She wanted the party equipment, but since it was rented from my supply company and covered in the prenup, it was out of her reach. Julie put most of our accounts on hold. By mutual agreement, she managed one team while I managed the other. Money could only be accessed for salaries and supplies. Everything else remained frozen until the divorce was finalized. All profits made after I completed my obligations went into a new account that Sherry completely controlled. I tried to make it as fair as possible. Sherry fought hard until Julie and her lawyer persuaded her to settle if she wanted to salvage any money. She requested a final meeting to express her feelings, but I declined. I later discovered that her lawyer was the fifth partner she had taken in just 18 months. They were all smooth-talking city types, most of whom lacked funds. I couldn't think of anything to say that didn't end with damn bit H. I tried to remain civil for Billy's sake. He had just turned three and didn't seem to miss her much. In the end, she received the party catering business, giving me a quarter of the profits. I didn't have the time for it anymore, and Julie dangled it like a temptation. It left her with a business and some working capital, which was all she got from me. I gained full custody of Billy. She had generous visitation rights, and I never denied her. However, there were rules. No men around Billy and if she exposed him to anything morally or physically harmful, she would lose her rights. As time passed, the visits became less frequent, and Billy didn't seem to mind. Angie and Ben became my anchors, guiding me through my grief and anger. Sherry's mom continued babysitting Billy, but only after agreeing that if she assisted Sherry in breaching the custody agreement, all contact would end. With Ben's support, Angie took on a motherly role. Billy still followed Ben around, and Ben had a photo of the three of them on his desk at work. People often assumed Billy was his stepson, and Ben allowed that impression to linger, saying it made him appear more family-oriented and helped him connect with new clients. 
I caught him off guard when I gave him a copy of my will, appointing them as executors and guardians for Billy in case anything happened to me. You are a family man, Ben. You always have been. You've got an incredible woman by your side, and you have us. I had never seen a male lawyer cry before. It was quite moving. Eventually I started dating again. It was enjoyable, and my needs were met. But I didn't find anyone I considered long-term. Angie teased me, insisting that Billy needed a mother. I simply looked at her. He has one. And as soon as I find her match, I'll be married so fast it'll make your head spin. The closest I came to that was with a lawyer, the daughter of a senior partner. She was a few years older, recently out of a tough divorce, and had secured a great job on the other coast. She was taking three months off to regroup. When she needed an escort, her dad reached out to me. Do me a favor, Will. She's new in town, and I'd love for her to accompany me to the banquet, but she needs an escort. It might help that she's considered attractive. I had no plans, so I agreed. I rented a Cadillac and it felt like deja vu all over again. Was she pretty? Absolutely. Barely five feet tall, blonde, fair-skinned, with a great figure. She looked like a living porcelain doll. I could feel the attraction building. I think she felt a little spark, and her lively personality took charge. Ooh, a real live redneck. I've never been this close to one before. Do you bite? I gave her my most serious expression. Yes, I do. Great. Ben, Angie, and her parents erupted in laughter, setting a fun tone for the evening. It was a charity gala, the most prestigious of the year, black tie and all. I felt pretty sharp in my outfit. The food was excellent and Rhonda chattered away. She later mentioned it was a nervous habit. She talked through the appetizer, the entree, and dessert. Do you ever stop talking? She flushed, but responded with an innocent smile. Only when I have something interesting in my mouth. Ben snorted coffee through his nose, and Angie giggled. Come on, you two. This is supposed to be a serious event. Afterward, there was a big band and dancing. Angie taught me how to dance to keep my spirits up. Sophie was a fantastic dance partner, graceful, fluid, and a delight to watch. She danced twice with her father and once with Ben, leaving the rest for me. As Ben and I waited by the bandstand for the girls, Sherry strolled by. Ben, Will, great to see you. Here alone, Will? You should really get out more. Let me introduce my escort, Robert Morgan. You might know his father, Ben, Wilson Morgan, founder of the Morgan Bank Chain. I watched her as she attempted to impress us. Her expression had become tense, and it seemed she had put on ten pounds. A quick glance at her escort made it clear he wasn't there for deep conversation. Just then, Angie and Sophie approached. She leaned in and kissed me on the cheek. Miss me, love? Good. I want you frustrated all night. It'll make our passionate night together even more exciting. Oh, sorry, who are your friends? I glanced past her and noticed Angie laughing, instantly realizing she had filled Sophie in on who Sherry was, and they were playing it up. Where are my manners? Sophie, this is Robert Morgan of the Banking Morgans, and this is Sherry Blankenship. She's back to her maiden name, by the way, a local businesswoman and my ex-wife. Sherry Robert meets Sophie Williams from Williams, Roberts, Howe, and Hatfield. You might have heard of them? Well, shall we waltz? We left them both speechless. As we danced, I whispered, Angie told you who she was, didn't she? Sophie drew a little closer. Yes, she did, and a bit of background. I hope Sherry has a terrible time tonight. Don't worry. Judging by the looks they're giving us, I think they will. We finished, and she pulled my head down to hers, giving me a two-minute kiss, complete with tongue. 
Did she see that? Give me a second to get the blood back to my brain. Yes, she saw it. And thank you. You're welcome. The pleasure was all mine. Sure enough, they came over to the table a bit later. Robert asked Sophie to dance and Sherry asked me. Just for old time's sake. Sophie smiled sweetly. I'd love to, but I promised my partner the rest of my dances. Same here. Sorry, Sherry, maybe next time. They looked stunned, while Angie covered her mouth with a napkin to stifle her laughter. They left without another word. I turned to Sophie. I'm glad you're not staying here permanently. She looked hurt. Why would you say something so cruel? I was just starting to like you. Because there would be fights wherever we went. I'd be fighting off the men who'd be flocking to you, and you'd be fighting to keep me off you. She smiled slowly. Who says I'd put up a fight? She didn't resist, and we spent all we could together. Angie even left Bully so that we could spend the weekend away from each other. To date, she has been the best lover I have ever had. She adored Billy and showed me pictures of her daughter, a cute little replica of herself. She looked to be about thirteen years old. My ex has her now. I've given him more time because soon we'll be three thousand miles apart. It made me sad to think that Billy was so far away. Life moved forward. I opened a barbecue restaurant to keep myself occupied. Myra was still managing the rental business, and she was doing such a great job that I left her to it. Running a restaurant is incredibly time-consuming, and the chances of success are slim. However, I had already built a strong reputation, and things went well. I ended up purchasing four food trucks, outfitting them, and sending them to nearby towns four days a week. They were a big hit. I still hadn't found anyone to settle down with and had pretty much stopped searching. It hits you when you least expect it, just when you start enjoying your life and feeling truly happy. I'm not talking about love, but about tragedy. Billy was nine years old. He would get off the bus at Angie's house and then ride his little four-wheeler through the woods when I got home. She'd ride with him, wave at me, and then head home. She'd give him a snack, check his schoolwork, and he'd help her with small chores. It was a system that worked well for all of us. On the rare occasions when I had a date, Billy would stay the night there. Angie had even decorated a room just for him. He called me at three o'clock, right after getting off the bus. He was crying. Come quick, Dad. Aunt Angie is on the floor crying and I can't get her up. I sped down the road. When I got there, it was just as he had said. She was on the floor, quietly sobbing. She wouldn't respond or speak to me. I was about to dial 911 when Ben's boss called. Will, I need you to go check on Angie, make sure she's okay. I'm with her now and she's not okay, she's not talking. Ben hasn't had an accident, has he? I could hear the emotion in his voice. Ben's dead, Will. He had a heart attack, and they said it was almost instant. We found him on the floor of his office when he missed a lunch meeting. He'd been gone for about an hour by then. I almost dropped the phone. Ben? Gone? He had become my best friend, but to Angie he was her entire world. I gathered her in my arms. Her face cleared for a moment, and she clung to me like a drowning person. Ben! Ben! I held her on the couch, rocking her like a child. The tears flowed, and they weren't all hers. She was like a ghost after that. We eventually made the funeral arrangements after Ben's boss brought us his will. He had just updated it. He wanted to be cremated and have his ashes scattered around the farm. It's the only place that ever felt like home, he wrote in the will. The turnout for the visitation and service was incredible. Many of his clients had become friends. His racetrack buddies showed up in large numbers, and every member and employee of his firm was there. 
Sherry attended and hugged Angie. She sat through the visitation, with Billy on her lap, and her mother beside her. They had grown close, especially over Billy. Her eyes followed me around the room, and she became anxious if I was out of sight. Ben had been fifty-two, older than Angie, and in good health. The doctors said it was an undetected condition, and they weren't sure what triggered it. The funeral ended. Friends and family went back to their lives, and the real grieving began. Billy, Sarah, Sherry's mom, and I stayed with her for about two weeks. She only began to return to herself toward the end of the second week. There was a minor setback when the will was read, mostly because it brought home the reality of his passing. When he updated his will, he included a few letters as his way of saying goodbye to those he loved. Angie received one. To this day I've never asked, and she's never offered to tell me what it said. He left one for Billy to open on his eighteenth birthday. He also left one for me. Dear Will, If you're reading this, I'm gone. I want to thank you for your friendship. You took a rigid Yankee lawyer and helped him become a better man, one who could relax and appreciate what he had. It was an honor to be your friend. I've left something for Billy, a college fund, enough to cover everything. I know you could afford it, but it gave me great joy to do this for him and for you. He's a wonderful kid. I'm sure if he follows your example, he'll become an even better man. I hope he remembers me fondly. Now, for the serious part. Take care of her, Will. She'll need you for a while. I know you loved her, and true to your honor and our friendship, you never let that affect things. Angie needs someone to love her now to help her through the dark times ahead. I'm sorry I won't be there. I would have loved to see Billy grow up. And Will, you need to find someone for yourself before you give up. Thank you for being the man you are and the friend I needed. Ben Naturally, the majority of his estate, the farm and investments, went to Angie. He left a significant amount of money to the dirt track he cherished so they could install safer bleachers, an announcer's booth, and a better PA system. They renamed the track in his honor. Angie spent a year trying to adjust, but eventually she gave up. I'm moving back to Philly for a while. I can't stay here. Everywhere I go, I see his ghost. Billy even at ten years old, cried for two days. I grieved in private. For eight years she had been my anchor. I had never felt more lost or alone. She gave us the keys and asked us to look after the farm. Every couple of weeks I would go, start up her little tractor to keep it in good condition, and check the house, making sure everything from the fixtures to the plumbing was in order. She left the power on and installed a state-of-the-art security system. I carried on with my life, focusing on Billy. He had reached the age where he preferred spending time with friends, and I knew it wouldn't be long before he'd be moving on, leaving me behind. Our house became the hangout spot for the boys. There were always at least three of his closest friends around. I made a point to get to know them and their parents, inviting them over a few times and chatting when they came to pick up their kids. Several of the moms were divorced, and I went on a few dates with one or two of them, but nothing serious. They wanted more, especially one of them. I was still in good shape, owned everything outright, and had two thriving businesses. I had franchised the restaurant and now had four locations spread across the region. Each had at least three trucks to serve the smaller towns. I was earning a lot of money. I found another small town with a demand for equipment, so I opened another store. Myra's husband became the manager, allowing him to finally stop sleeping with his boss, unless they both wanted to. Sherry lost her business when she no longer had the special equipment rental deal she used to. Her head chef quit to start his own venture and she lost so much business that she eventually had to close. 
she became an office manager for a large insurance company and married a lawyer. That marriage lasted 18 months before he caught her cheating. She still has a job and is now engaged again. I hope this one lasts. She still sees Billy, mostly on holidays and birthdays. I was exhausted. I'd been out of town, busy launching my sixth restaurant. While I traveled, Sarah stayed with Billy, and when I got back, both of them were standing there, grinning at me. What's going on? I asked, glancing down to make sure my fly wasn't open. We've got a visitor. Go on inside, they said. Inside, it was Angie. She rushed into my arms, hugging me and crying. We had stayed in touch, calling each other at least once a month. I could always sense sadness in her voice, and I'd always tell her to come home, that we missed her. She'd usually respond by saying she'd think about it. I asked how long she was staying. 30 or 40 years, I hope. I'm home, Will. I'm not leaving this time. I'm tired of having to go to a park just to see grass, and tired of living next to people I barely know who don't care about being neighbors. I want to see stars, not smog, when I look up at night. She took my hand. And I want to see you every day. And Billy, I can't believe how big he's gotten. I bet he'll be taller than you when he's done growing. I want to see Myra, the guys at the dirt track, all my real friends. By then, she was crying on my shoulder. I just held her, feeling truly happy for the first time in nearly two years. We fixed up her house. She looked older and a bit out of shape, but over the weeks, she slimmed down by working in her garden and riding her favorite tractor. Her youthful glow returned. Sarah moved into a retirement community, taking a one-bedroom apartment nearby. She was surprised when they later moved her into a larger two-bedroom unit. She was even more surprised when I started paying her bills. She protested, but I stopped her. There were times when Billy and I really needed you, and you were there for us. This is my way of repaying you. You need a bigger place so Billy can spend weekends with you, and a happy grandmother is what he needs. End of story. We had dinner together every night Billy wasn't with his friends, either at my place or hers. Three months passed, and we started going out, movies, concerts, even a little dancing. She visited Ben's old firm and left in tears. They made sure we were invited to all their events. She insisted they weren't dates, just two old friends spending time together. Everything became clear as we sat on the front porch swing, watching Billy and his friends tear up the field on their four-wheelers. It was a bit chilly, and we had a light blanket over us. I stopped swinging and looked her in the eye. Marry me. What? Marry me. I've loved you for years. You love me, but you won't admit it. Let's stop playing this game and settle down. Tears were streaming down her face. But our ages. Listen, I know you're 50, and I'm 43. I don't care. I don't care. I don't care. I love you, and I will until the day I die. She was swaying, sniffling. This is an ultimatum. Marry me, or I swear on Ben's memory I'll never step foot on this property again. Yes or no? Right now. She didn't answer. Tears were in my eyes as I thought about what I was about to lose. I was halfway across the porch when she tackled me. We rolled down the steps, and Billy rushed over. He helped a crying Angie to her feet. Are you okay? Yes, sweetheart, I am. I just got some good news. In a few days or weeks, I'm officially going to be your mom. I hope that makes you happy. That day, I learned what an incredible child I'd raised. You've always pretty much been my mom. Now I can finally say it. I love you. Mom. The wedding and the celebration that followed became the stuff of legend, talked about for years. Myra spared no effort. We got married in the spring, outdoors, in a meadow on the farm. The reception was held under a Grand Castle-style tent. Most of Ben's former colleagues from his firm attended. Sophie, who was visiting her parents, joined us as well. She kissed Angie and told her how lucky she was. From the look in her eyes, I knew I had some explaining to do. The guys from the track restored her car and gifted it to her as a wedding present. The years passed by in happiness and harmony. Billy graduated from college, got married, and he and his wife took over the businesses. We gifted them my old house as a wedding present, completely renovated. They blessed us with three grandkids. He even named his son Bennett. I would sometimes see Angie grow melancholic, knowing her thoughts were with him. On what would have been their 50th anniversary, I surprised her with an oil portrait of him by a renowned artist. She went to bed and cried for two hours. We hung the portrait above the fireplace. He looks so serious, and though my eyesight isn't what it used to be, I swear that on nights when the fire is glowing and Angie's on the floor playing with our youngest granddaughter, he's smiling. That's the thing. I really like you. Normally, I'd send you home tonight. We would have met maybe a dozen times, 
and on each date I would have let you go a little further, maybe on the ninth or tenth date I would have shown you my talents. Then we would have a grand event, candles, soft music, maybe whipped cream and melted chocolate. She got nervous when I didn't say anything. I couldn't speak. She was standing there in her stockings. I thought I was going blind. I literally fell off the couch. I almost dozed off because she had been gone so long, and I heard someone clearing his throat. I sat on the couch while she made coffee, and then excused myself and went out to take off my dress. We even wiped the windows before leaving her house. After about 20 minutes, she asked me to walk her to the door and offered me coffee.